Good evening, Temple Baptist. Hope you're doing well. Uh, glad you could join us for our study in 2 Timothy as we continue uh, to work our way through. Uh, hope this has been uh, a good study for you. Hope it's given you some practical application. Uh, we always like to look for that in Scripture. Uh, and um, you may be saying, well, what does Timothy uh, and, and Paul's relationship have to do with us? Uh, you know, Timothy is actually receiving this sort of discipleship from Paul. Paul is really investing in him. And what Paul is doing is passing on um, uh, this, um, this ministry to young Timothy. Uh, and in order to, to do that, he's called Timothy to do some things, to remember, uh, remember his resources, remember the giftedness, remember the, the power of the spirit that he has within him. Uh, he's called him to remember uh, his salvation, remember his heritage of faith. And all those are going to be great assets for Timothy as he seeks to, to live into that ministry. And so the question is, what does that have to do with us? Well, you know, as individuals, as churches, as Temple Baptists, uh, you know, the call is really to pass on that faith, the faith that you have, uh, to another generation. Uh, so in order for that to be a successful transition, uh, I, I believe we need to do those same things. As a church, we need to remember. We need to remember the resources, remember the call, remember the, the spirit, remember the power that you have. Uh, would do well, you know, not to be ashamed, uh, as we looked at last week. Uh, so Paul has called Timothy already in just a couple of weeks. He's called him to remember uh, some things. He's called him to not be ashamed. Uh, and today we're going to look at a call to en endure. So a call to endure it. So I, I think for a church to uh, have an effective ministry that spans generations. All of those things have to be present. We have to celebrate our path. We have to remember the call uh, for Temple Baptist Church. Remember the resources that are available uh, to you. You have to remember uh, the spiritual heritage that, that you have. You have to remember what God has done in your midst in the past. Uh, you have to not be ashamed of the gospel in the midst of a very um, uh, culture that's very much changed. And as we're going to see today in 2 Timothy chapter 2, uh, we're going to see along with that call to remember, along with that call to not be ashamed, there's going to be a call to repentance. So I mean a call to endurance. That's what we're going to look at today, a call to endurance, because the Christian race isn't a sprint. You know, how many times have we known people that have uh, really burst onto the scene and had really just uh, been a dynamic Christian, but over a period of time, it, it was just a brief stay in their life. And so what we're looking at today is just really this, this uh, endurance, uh, this, this marathon that we're called uh, to, to, to live into that is our Christian journey. So let's just jump right in looking at 2 Timothy chapter 2. First of all, we're going to see there's this call to continuing endurance. Uh, look at verse 1. It says, You, therefore, my son, be strong in the grace, grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul begins that section or this chapter with the word therefore, so it has to refer us back to previous verses. And in, in this case, he goes back to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, where we have that positive example of, uh, uh, of, a, of a great Christian warrior, a great Christian minister uh, on, on, on Sepphoris, who was actually a tremendous uh, asset to Paul. He he was he was the man who sought out Paul in the Roman prison uh, to minister to him, and and so Paul gave that example to Timothy for a reason. He says because of the testimony of 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 this one person, uh, you also be strong in that grace that's in Christ Jesus. So we see this grace wasn't something new. Uh, to the life of Timothy. And we see that call, you therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. It wasn't something new to Timothy. Uh, he, had, he had long been an associate of Paul. Uh, he couldn't associate with Paul without hearing about grace. And, and, and that means this call to grace is not a new call in Timothy. Uh, his life. He, he understood that. He'd heard that before. And so then we have this call to be strong. And, and, and we notice that that's in the present tense. Uh, when you give a command that's in the Greek present tense, it gives, it gives this focus upon this continuing action. 
So we could translate this imperative this way. You, therefore, my son, continue being strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. So we see where that's a tremendous call of, of endurance. It's a call for Timothy to continue in that which he has, has begun. Uh, he's already begun in. And when we come to Christ by grace to be saved, trusting in him, resting in him, uh, in his merit. Uh, so it's grace that we enter into this salvation with. And so grace doesn't just stop at the cross. It only begins there. And, and in the same way, we continue what we have been doing. We continue with endurance by grace. Uh, so that's what Paul is encouraging Timothy, to be strong in the grace that's in Christ Jesus. That grace saves us, but it's also that grace that gives us the ability to endure for him. So first of all, we see this, this tremendous, tremendous call to continuing in endurance. And so I would say to you as an individual Christian and you as Temple Baptist Church that God is calling you to continue with endurance uh, continue to press forward. The grace that you have experienced to enter into that relationship with him is that grace that gives you the ability to endure. And, and so here's the tremendous thing about Paul. He doesn't only give this call to endurance, but also he gives a strategy for this continuing endurance. That's the second point. Look at verse two. It says, and the thing which you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So uh, Paul has issued this call to continue, uh, and, and now he's given Timothy a strategy to continue, a strategy for this ministry to continue on. And I believe a strategy that's going to be significant for you as Temple Baptist Church to continue on with an effective ministry. He, you know, he has a method by which Timothy is to continue in this grace and by which he's able to impart that same grace to others. And it's, it's the strategic method that we know as discipleship. You know, Timothy is to take those teachings of grace that were given to him by Paul, and, and, and Timothy is to pass them on to others. But it, but it doesn't stop there. Uh, also, we see that those also uh, continue to take that on, that message on, those, those teaching on. And so what we begin to see here is a multiplied ministry. And, and so Paul entrusted to Timothy, and, and Timothy's entrusting to others. Those others are going to entrust it to even others. So we see this multiplication taking place. And, and as Paul has taught Timothy, so Timothy now is multiplying that ministry by teaching others uh, those teachings, and then just goes on and on and on. That's how the world is reached. That's how the nations are reached. So we have to pause there as I challenge you each and every week. Pause and ask yourself some reflective questions uh, Paul had this Timothy in his life that he was investing these teachings in, and he was challenging him also to invest in others. So we have to just ask yourself this question tonight. Do you have a Timothy? Is there someone in whose life you are passing on this grace of Christ? Is there someone that you are discipling? Is there someone that you are coming alongside of? Now, I want to make just an obvious point here. If, if we are a parent uh, or if we are a grandparent, we have a ready-made Timothy. Uh, and, and that's your child or your grandchild. So if, if we have family members, if, you know, if we're a father, if we're a mother, uh, we have a ready-made person to disciple, to pass on to this grace to. So we have to pause and ask ourselves, uh, are we doing that? Are we investing in discipleship? And because I'll just say this to you, as a congregation, uh, the measure of your dis, of, of your effectiveness for the future is going to hinge on your effectiveness in this area of discipleship. Uh, so are you discipling? Do you have a Timothy? Uh, and you say, well, uh, I don't have a, uh, I don't have family. I don't have a uh, child or I don't have a grandchild. Uh, there are others whose life you could be touching. There are others whose life you can be ministering to. So Two, uh, two great calls we've seen already in chapter two. There's this call to endurance, uh, and, and then there's a strategy uh, of endurance. And then I love uh, the third thing we notice that these, uh, these examples of this continuing endurance. Paul goes on to illustrate. I, I love illustrations. Illustrations are really windows to see into the spiritual truth. And, and Paul illustrates this, this principle of 
with, with just graphic illustrations that he shares. And these illustrations, each one of them present certain characteristics, which are also required by the one that would be the enduring follower of Christ. So let's just look at those examples. Look at verse three. We have the example of a soldier. Look at verse three. Suffer hardship with me as what? As a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier is in active no soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life, so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. You know, I grew up around military base. Many of you, you guys are, are located around a military base. Many of you are probably actually military. Uh, and, and so we have been able to see uh, firsthand uh, that, that military life is hard. You know, there are certain people known as drill sergeants whose sole duty, it seems, is, is to bring about a hardship. And if you're a drill sergeant, here it is, I'm apologizing. But it just seems like that uh, they, they are, are such uh, instrumental people in the training of these soldiers uh, that they, they have under their command. It's just a tremendous uh, uh, thing to watch. You know, there's marching, there's running, there's training, and it goes on before the sun comes up. It's, it's not an easy life, and it doesn't even end when the sun goes down. And, and so the one thing we've, I've noticed, I've never been military, but I've always been around military base. Uh, I've noticed just that the, the, the military life is a life of discipline. And so I would say to you, the example that we see here is the Christian life is much the same way. The Christian is called to a similar life of, of discipline. He, he's called to suffer hardship the way a soldier would suffer hardship. And, and, and that's just simply with dedicated service. You know, no soldier, Paul says, who's in active service, uh, the, the phrase he uses, entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life. So what he's saying is he doesn't try to fight on the battlefield while at the same time holding down a, a, a second job, you know, uh, during the day. Uh, the, the last thing a soldier on a battlefield needs is other areas of entanglement. He, he has this one function, and his one function is to obey these orders. And when he's ordered to march, he marches. And when he's ordered to fight, he fights. And, and so that example of the soldier translates perfectly over into the life of a Christian uh, because we are called, when we enter into the salvation, we're called to this life of, of, of uh, being in, engaged in this battle. We're, we're called to free ourselves from these other entanglements that can come our way. Instead of being caught up in, in all the details of every single day that life has to offer, our main priority is to seek to please our Lord. You know, we've been purchased, we've been bought with a price, uh, we become a doulos, we become this, this servant of Christ. And so our singular purpose at this point is, is to please him, is to do what he says. So we, we have to look at this and ask ourselves some, some uh, reflective questions. Is there something in our life that's drawing our attention away from the Lord? Uh, you know, if you're going into battle with a soldier, the last thing you want is a soldier that's distracted by something other than the task at hand. And, and, and so sometimes in our walk with Christ, we allow these other things to grab our attention and we find ourselves getting tangled up in these uh, entanglements of life that Paul refers to them. I just want to encourage you. You know, our purpose is to bring glory and honor to Christ and to serve Him. And if there's things that are getting in the way of that, they're probably things that we need to let go of in our life. You know, so if there's something that's drawing our attention away from Christ, away from the Lord, it's, it's time to give that over to Him. So Paul uses this great example of, he uses this great example of, of a soldier. And that, what a great illustration and many of you can relate to that because you have lived that life or maybe you're presently living that life. Uh, the second one, he uses the example of an athlete. Look at verse 5. And also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. You know, there are a lot of parallels, I believe, that can be drawn between sports and the, and the Christian life. Uh, Paul does this... Uh, in other, other places in Scripture where he likens the Christian life to a race that must be run all the way to the conclusion. You, ha you have to finish it out. Uh, or he speaks of the boxer who, who makes every punch count. Or he speaks of the athlete who competes to win, to win a prize. But on this 
in, in this verse, Paul is focusing upon a single a single parallel. Uh, if if it's a focus upon the rules, you know, when you participate in sports, there's certain certain rules that must be followed. Uh, a, a runner can't choose the, his own course to run. Uh, a player in a game cannot make up his own rules. Uh, boundaries must be maintained. If you're playing basketball, there's an out of bounds. If you if you're playing baseball, you have the foul lines. Uh, so everybody has to play according to those, and those rules must be followed. Uh, otherwise, there's disqualification. So it, it, here's the parallel. You know, walking in grace doesn't mean an absence of rules. Uh, you, you know, Paul dealt with that with the with the Christians in Galatia. Uh, you know, they 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 suggested, well, you know, if grace abounds when sin comes, well, just let's sin all the more, and we live however we want to live. And occasionally, you probably run into people that have thought that and said, because of God's grace, it doesn't matter how I live my life. But here's what Paul is saying. Our life, uh, the Christian life, like like an athlete participating uh, in, an, in an event, there are boundaries, there are rules that must be lived by. Freedom in Christ is not a, is not a call to live as we please. It's a call to live as he pleases. So, and so we don't make the rules. We, we don't invent the rules. We play according to the rules that, that Christ lays out for us. So two great illustrations he's given us. The soldier uh, that, uh, you know, endures his hardship, uh, a life of discipline. Uh, the, the athlete who has boundaries, who has rules that, that we live by, and God's word serves as those boundaries that we, that we live our life by. And then uh, the third example is the example of a farmer. Uh, look at verse 6. It says, The hardworking farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. You know, I'm, I'm not so sure that the force of Paul's statement comes through in, in our understanding of verse 6. The point of the passage is that, that, is that first you work, uh, and, and, and then you reap the results of that work. Every farmer knows this. You know, I've never been a farmer, uh, but every farmer knows this. First you plant, then you harvest. Uh, you, you can't do one until you've done the other. There's no possibility of getting it out of order. Uh, notice that, that, that this illustration, just like the other two, has a, has a reward that's attached to it. Think with me back to the soldier. The soldier is the call is for the soldier in the illustration is to suffer hardship, and the reward is that you please the one that enlisted you. So Paul is using this analogy to describe the Christian life. A soldier suffers hardship, and the reward is he pleases the one that enlists you. And then secondly, we see the athlete. You follow the rules. You live according to the boundaries that God has set. And what happens? You win the prize. And then the farmer, you, you work hard, you, you, you put in the work, you, you do the due diligence, and you receive your share of the harvest. So we see all of these are attached to us uh, in, in, in our Christian life. So, man, it's just been amazing just to see this call. Uh, that Paul is passing on to Timothy. He's saying, Timothy, you, you, you really need, I'm passing the torch to you. You got to have this call to remember. You got to have this call not to be ashamed. And you got to have this call to endure. And now he's saying the same thing to us. He's saying the same thing to Temple, uh, to endure. And, and then fourthly, we, we see the motivation. And, and, and this is what I want you to not miss. Uh, because... All that we've looked at tonight, th th there's difficulty attached to that. I mean, think about it. Uh, th th your Christian life is to be that of a, a soldier, suffer hardship. Man, that, that's, not, that's not encouraging. Uh, you know, an athlete, follow the rules. Uh, a farmer, do the hard work, do the due diligence. But, but here's, the, here's the wonderful thing about it. Uh, we, we see the motivation and, and this is what it was for Paul. This is the motivation for this continuing endurance. Listen to what he says in verse 8. Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even to the imprisonment as a criminal. And, and But here's what makes it all worth it. But the word of God is not imprisoned. You know, 
uh, Paul uses finally, after using the example of the soldier, he uses the example of the athlete, he uses the example of the farmer, now he uses the example of himself. His final example is of himself. He says to Timothy, you remember uh, you remember to remember Jesus the, the way I remember Jesus. You, you do it no matter what the cost, even if it takes you to a Roman dungeon. Now, why would Paul allow his endurance to take him even to a Roman dungeon as a, as a prisoner? What was the motivation of, of suffering the evils for Paul of this Roman prison? What gave Paul the, the, the gasoline inside of him to endure this circumstances? What was his motivation? Why did he, why did he celebrate in, in prison? Why did he, why did he celebrate the, the hardship that he endured? And here it is. It was the fact that he knew the word of God is not imprisoned. That, that's a great place for an amen. I don't know if you say amen during Bible studies or, or if you say amen during worship service, but, but if you do, man, that was a great place for one. Although Paul was imprisoned, although Paul had been, had been, been beaten, he'd been thrown in prison, he'd been run out of cities, he'd been involved in riots, all of these things happened to Paul, but the word of God is not in prison. They could put Paul in prison, but they could not imprison the gospel. So that, that's the motivation. Uh, that, that, that's, that's the reason we endure it all. That's the reason Paul was celebrating in the midst of such hostility. That's the reason he was celebrating when, he was, when he's handcuffed to these soldiers. Because the gospel can't be stopped. And if you, th if you think about it, that's the closing message of the book of Acts. You know, a great deal of the book of Acts takes place within various prisons or, or courtrooms. It, it, it's, a, it's, it's actually a book about the intent, uh, the attempt to imprison the gospel. It, it comes to a close with, with Paul being brought to Rome. He's in house arrest. And, and Acts chapter 28, verse 31 says this, And he stayed two full years in his own rented quarters and was welcoming to all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God and teaching concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with all openness. And, and here's how the book of the word that the book of Acts ends with, unhindered. <laughs> do, you, do you see the, the very last word in the very last verse? It's also the very last word in, in the Greek text. It's that word unhindered. And, and the point is, they can lock up Paul but they could not lock up the gospel. He was chained, but the gospel was free. And that's a liberating truth. Uh, the, 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 the gospel is winning. It cannot be contained. It cannot be imprisoned. It will succeed in accomplishing that for which it was designed. And that's a great motivation for us. Regardless of what happens to us as believers, regardless of what is attempted to do to us as the church, we're told that the, that the gates of hell will not prosper against his church. So that's that call to it. That's that motivation for endurance because we can endure whatever, but it doesn't matter what we go through. They cannot, the evil one cannot stop the gospel of Jesus Christ. Great place to say amen, church. And, and everywhere, if you notice that even in our culture, even in this century, everywhere the gospel, everywhere the gospel has tried to be stamped out, it's grown like wildfire. And, and so that's what Paul is trying to, to, to relay in this message to Timothy. That's what he wants to say to us. Uh, I, I understand uh, that this Christian walk is difficult at times. Uh, understand there'll be times when you'll feel like a soldier and, and you have to endure these hardships. I uh, understand there'll be times w when you've been an athlete and there'll be boundaries that are set for you that, that may not be great for you, may not be the best in, in your mind. Uh, and I understand that, that, that there is work that has to be done before the harvest. But here's the promise. The gospel of Jesus Christ cannot be stopped, and that motivates us. That motivates Paul. 
to pass these teachings on to Timothy. That motivates Temple Baptist Church to pass this message, this gospel message, on to another generation. So that calls us to be faithful. In our faithfulness to these teachings, our, the generation behind us does not need a watered-down gospel. The generation behind us does not need a diluted gospel, does not need a diluted word of God. It needs the, the inerrant word of God. It needs the true gospel. And so in order for that to happen in, in a culture that has so many voices screaming for their attention and vying for their ears, we have to be faithful as individuals. We have to be faithful as the church. We have to endure so that we can pass on to the next generation the gospel. And, 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 and they deserve to hear that. And, and the gospel will, will uh, bring about transformation in their lives. I can't. I don't know if you can tell it or not, church. But that's exciting to me. Uh, the power of the gospel is exciting for me. It's exciting for a church. So I, I would say, uh, just like Timothy has, has been told by Paul, man, we got to remember uh, at, at Temple Baptist. We got to remember. We got to remember our. our uh, Resources. We got to remember the power that's available to us. We have to remember our spiritual heritage. We have to not be ashamed of the gospel. Uh, we we have to endure. We have to endure and successfully pass the baton of the true gospel along to another generation. Uh, and, and, and that's exciting to me uh, to be around folks that desire to see the gospel radically change people's lives. Church, I want to pray with you. Uh, I, like I said, I hope these have been beneficial. I know this format's a little awkward. Hopefully someday we'll be able to be together in person. Uh, but I don't want you to miss uh, the opportunity that God, uh, through his word, would challenge you as a congregation uh, to remember, uh, to not be ashamed, and to endure, and, and successfully pass the baton on to the next generation of believers. Father, we're grateful for your word tonight and the opportunity we've had to study. Lord, as we're able to look into your conversation with this young pastor, Timothy, but Lord, we know these words are just as relevant to us, Lord, as individual Christians. Lord, it's just as relevant to Temple Baptist, Lord, as their great desire, Lord, is to pass the gospel on, uh, Lord, to another generation of believers. And Lord, if you tarry, uh, Lord, our prayer is that they'll remain faithful and pass it on to another generation until you come. So, Father, give us that 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 remember uh, that ability to remember to recall uh, who you are, Lord, what you've done for us. Lord, give us that ability and 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 to answer the call to not be ashamed. And Lord, just give us the strength through your Spirit to endure, because when we endure as faithful believers, Lord, we see the power of your gospel, not only in our lives, but Lord, we see it accomplish its purpose in the world. Uh, Lord, it's my prayer, uh, Lord, that these words uh, that have been spoken tonight, Lord, would just inspire this church, Father, to endure for your sake. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church. Uh, there again, I, I just uh, pray that this is beneficial to you. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off in, in 2 Timothy next week, and I look forward to being with you. God bless.